We are here in Omaha, Nebraska this morning with Warren Buffett, the chairman and CEO of Berkshire Hathaway. He's just released his 55th annual shareholder letter to, uh, to the shareholders over this weekend. And this is actually the 13th year that we are now in Omaha talking to him after that letter. This is a show that we call Ask Warren so that people can write in their own questions to Mr. Buffett after they've read that shareholder's letter. Um, but obviously this morning, given the news, there are a lot of other questions that people have concerning the stock market. Um, let's jump right into it with Mr. Buffett, who is here with us right now. And uh, Warren, thank you for being here today. It's oh, good to see you. Thanks for having me. I uh, want to talk about the letter. Uh, obviously, one of the things that you touch on in the level uh, on the letter is when people should be buying stocks. We're going to dig into a lot of it, but when you're looking at the futures down about 818 points this morning, I think probably the first thing viewers want to hear from you are your thoughts on what's happening with the coronavirus, if this is a reason to panic, and if you are worried about this. Well, I, I, I don't know I have any special thoughts beyond the news on the coronavirus. Uh, the very first day I bought stocks was March 12, 1941, 40, 40, uh, 42. And uh, the stocks were down about 2% that day, as it turned out. Unfortunately, I bought in the morning. So when I came home in the evening and my dad told me the execution price, it was down 2%. But, uh, uh, if you're buying a business, uh, and, and that's what stocks are, businesses. In fact, people would be better off if they say, I bought a business today, not a stock today, because that gives you a, a different perspective on it. Then, Presumably, you buy a farm, if you buy an apartment house, if you buy a business, you're going to own it for 10 or 20 or 30 years. And the real question is, is has the 10-year or 20-year outlook for, for American businesses changed in the last 24 hours or 48 hours? And we're going to, you'll notice many of the businesses we own, partially own, American Express, we've owned it for 20 years, Coca-Cola, we've owned it for 40 years. Uh, those are businesses. And... Uh, you don't buy or sell your business based on on uh, on today's headlines. And uh, if it gives you a chance to buy something that you like and you can buy it even cheaper, then it's your good luck, basically. Although there are a lot of people who look at the market and they say, look, I want to buy, but I don't want to buy when the market's sitting at new highs, when it's been hitting new records every day. Maybe it's off 800 points this morning, but maybe there's more of a decline to come because the effect of the coronavirus is going to be an impact on the global economy. IMF said that over the weekend. You are going to see weakness as not only China, but other countries try and address this. Uh, you're right. It may not change things over the five or 10 year span of things. But if I think that I can buy something for potentially 10 percent cheaper, maybe more than that, if I wait a week or a month, maybe that's what I'm sitting around. Well, if you think that, then. You've got to, you're going to get fabulously rich if you're right. <laughs> All you have to do is just keep buying at 10 day intervals and keep <laughs> taking your 10 day prediction. If I knew what the market was going to do, obviously, but you, you, you don't, uh, I, I don't think anybody knows what the market's going to do. I think you know, do know whether you're making an intelligent purchase at a given price. Everybody, when they buy a stock, if you're going to buy, say, General Motors that has a billion, 400 million shares out. You should be able to take a yellow pad like you have there and on one page say, let's say it's selling for 30, it isn't selling that low, but that'd be 42 billion. You should say, I am buying the General Motors company for $42 billion because, and you should get it on a piece of paper. And then if you want to have a separate piece of paper, since I think I know what the stock market's going to do, so I know whether it'll be higher or lower in it, but you don't. Uh, you don't have that. The you real, don't, but the real if, if I worry that the economy is going to slow down, not just for the quarter, but for the year, that would impact how many cars I think they might be able to sell or even produce. Uh, I'll, guarantee, I'll guarantee you cars are going to slow down someday. <laughs> they, uh, in, in, in 1932, General Motors had 19,000 dealers. That's more than all the auto dealers in the United States today. There were only 125 million people then, but they had 19,000 dealers. They produced... Uh, or sold, and there was one month, I think, when they sold less than a tenth of a car, right at a tenth of a car per dealer. That was a terrific time to buy General Motors. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and forget about the market. If, if you can predict the market, you don't need to read balance sheets. You don't need, you don't need, to, read, uh, you don't need to read anything. You, you certainly can't predict the market by reading the daily newspaper. That is for sure. And you really can't, you certainly can't predict the market by listening to me. Uh, but you're buying businesses. And if you had planned to buy a local service station yesterday and it was closing today, I don't think you'd tear your hair out or anything like that. You'd have already looked at where it was located and the contract that it had with the suppliers and made a decision on competition. Uh, 
people because they can make decisions every second in stocks, whereas they can't with farms. They think an investment in stocks is different than an investment in a business or an investment in a farm or investment in an apartment house, uh, but it isn't. It, if, if you get your money's worth in terms of future earning power over the next 10 or 20 or 30 years, you're going to have made a good investment, and you can't pick them from day to day. If you can do that, you can, well, I haven't met anybody yet that, that knows how to do it. You, you made a point of that in a letter this year where you highlighted a book that was written by Edgar Lawrence Smith back in 1924. And you said until he came along, nobody really realized the compound interest effect of buying stocks, not just buying businesses, but buying stocks themselves. Edgar Lawrence Smith changed the world with that book, and the people have forgotten all about it now. Although in the 1920s, it, would, it became more and more gospel as the boom went on. but. Edgar Orton Smith set out to write a book on bonds versus stocks. And he said if he went in with the idea that bonds would be a better investment in times of deflation and stocks would be a better uh, investment in times of inflation. And the first line of his book was to say that he'd been wrong. But he had enough sense to look at his evidence. I, mean, I think Darwin said if you found evidence that was contrary to what you already believed, write it down in 30 minutes or your, your mind will just block it out. I mean, people have a great resistance to new evidence. And he said if a stock yields 4 percent and a bond yields 4 percent, which was what he was talking about then, the stock was going to outperform the bonds because there were retained earnings that were building beyond that yield. And that's, that had been true for a long, long time, but nobody paid any attention to it. Uh, we don't get rich on our dividends that we receive, although we're happy to receive them. We get rich on, on, on the fact that the retained earnings are used to build new earning power, repurchase uh, shares, which increases your ownership in the company, and, and, uh, uh, and, and Berkshire has retained earnings ever since we started. That's the only reason Berkshire's worth a lot more, as we retain earnings. That, that, that led... Keynes to actually say that this was an important book. People paid attention to it, but you're right. It added to the frenzy that built up to 1929. Well, that, that is true because you can get, my old boss Ben Graham told me very early on, you get more trouble with a good idea than a bad idea because the good idea works. I mean, it's a good idea to buy a home, for example, and then people go crazy. Sometimes. The good idea works and it works and it works. Stocks work out better than bonds most of the time. And after a while, people forget that there were some other limiting conditions. With Edgar Lawrence Smith's book, it was that when bonds yield the same as stocks, which was the case then, that stocks are going to outperform because they have this retained earnings. So stocks started going up in the 20s, and all of a sudden they were selling at five or six times the prices as when he bought the book. And the original correct uh, perception on his part had experienced changing conditions, but People just looked, they, they got their confirmation through stock prices. And people, that's what happens in bull markets. People, people start out thinking stocks are cheap, and then they start thinking stocks have gone up. <laughs> and, and a stock can be a good buy or a bad buy. A bond can be a good buy or a bad buy. It depends on price. But that leads us to today. I mean, if his premise was that stocks are always going to be a better, uh, a better investment than bonds, that's kind of what you hear today, which we've been hearing for a while, is, Tina, there is no alternative, right? You have to buy stocks because bond yields are so low, because interest rates are so low. Well, if, if you look at the present situation, we've talked about this before, that you get more for your money in stocks than bonds. That doesn't have to be the case. I mean, uh, uh, but it's usually been the case in, in America, very usually been the case. And, and if you buy a... 30-year bond today with a yield 2 percent, you're paying 50 times earnings for an investment where the earnings can't go up for 30 years. Now, if somebody said, I want to sell you a stock that's at 50 times earnings and the earnings can't go up for 30 years, you'd say that doesn't sound very good. Stocks are way better than 30-year bonds. I mean, it's, 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 it, that's clear. And, and that's one of the alternatives people have. People really have three basic alternatives, short-term cash, which is an option of doing something later on, long-term bonds or, or, or long-term stocks, and stocks are cheaper than bonds. Charlie said recently, Charlie Munger, the vice chairman at Berkshire Hathaway, had his daily journal meeting just a couple of weeks ago, and at that meeting he said that there's a lot of wretched excess out there and that there's a lot of trouble coming as a result. Do you agree with that? There's always trouble coming. 
Yeah, there was trouble coming in 1942 when I bought that first stock, all kinds of trouble. Philippines were going to fall pretty soon. I'm never, uh, uh, there was all kinds of trouble in 1949. There was trouble, uh, certainly trouble in 2008 when I wrote an article for the New York Times. I said trouble is coming, but I said buy stocks. <laughs> <laughs> would you repeat that this time? If trouble's coming, would you still say buy stocks right now? I would say buy stocks if you get enough for your money. And, you know, we buy a few stocks. But we don't look at, we're, we're not buying the stock market. We're saying, I am buying, let's say American Express, we own American Express. You know, there's 815 million shares out and sells it this morning at 126 or something like that. So it's selling for roughly $100 billion. Now the real question is whether the company is worth more or less than $100 billion. It isn't what the stock is going to do tomorrow or next week or next month. You said uh, just a few minutes ago when we asked you on Worldwide Exchange, right now Berkshire Hathaway is a net buyer of stocks. You are in a net buying position? We've been a net buyer of stocks, or I've been actually been a personal net buyer of stocks ever since I was 11, every year. And, and, uh, uh, there's been 15 American presidents in my lifetime, more than a third. I've lived under a third of the life. <laughs> I didn't buy stocks under Hoover. I was only about six months old then. But... But there have been seven Republicans after that and seven Democrats. I bought stocks under every one of them. Now, I haven't bought stocks every day. There have been a few times I've thought stocks were, were really quite high. Uh, and I've even written an article once or twice. But that's very seldom. But you wrapped up your partnership at one point, I wrapped too. up my partnership once because, because you thought it was too expensive. Yeah. Okay. But this is not a time like that? Uh, we own $240 billion worth of stocks. Now, we look at that as $240 billion worth of businesses. Uh, that we own parts of. But uh, I love owning those businesses. You've also got more than $125 billion in cash sitting around. Yeah, well, that's, we'd like to buy more businesses. We are here, Warren, with you at Berkshire Hathaway's headquarters building. This is upstairs in the room that's called the Cloud Room. And this is a room where you often take students to kind of talk to them about questions they have when they come to visit you. Uh, you also do some other things up here, too, other presentations. Yeah, I, I, I had students here for dozens of years. and. Uh, uh, for many years, 40 schools would come in. They'd come in groups of eight uh, at uh, five days. I'd spend a year. And they, they'd come from all over the world. We had them from Peru. We had them from China. We had them from Israel. And, uh, and we had a good time, always. Uh, uh, I get, I've given it up now. I, but I, I, I started teaching when I was 21. And I, when I got to about 88, I thought... <laughs> I'll take a rest. <laughs> well, there are a lot of questions that are coming in from viewers that have been hitting here today. Uh, they're waking up this morning looking at the stock market indicated down by almost 800 points mm -hmm. for the Dow. We're actually off our worst levels of the morning, which is something to say when you're still looking at the Dow down by about 786 points. But people have a lot of questions about the economy. They're wondering what's happening right now, particularly with the coronavirus out there. Um, you have a lot of economic data at your fingertips because not only are the many businesses that Berkshire owns, but the businesses you own pieces in. Uh, what are you seeing right now around the globe? Well, it, it affects various businesses. I'm, uh, uh, I, would, I would say that I received commentary. I get, I get some commentary monthly with, uh, from, from almost all of the companies, and, and a good many of them had some comment about how it was affecting them, and however it was affecting them at, at that time, I'm sure it's accentuated. But they've been affected by, they were affected by tariffs, they're affected by taxes, they're affected by, the most thing is they're affected by competitors and supply and demand over time. And I don't have the faintest idea what our businesses will be doing six months from now or 12 months from now. I do think that not only our businesses, but American business generally will be doing fabulously better 30 years from now or 20 years from now. And the, the long term is very in my view, is very easy to predict in a general way, but an important way. I don't think there's any way to predict what the stock market will do 10 minutes from now, 10 days from now, or 10 months from now. So I work on what I think I've, I'm able to do, and as desirable as it might be to know what was going to happen 10 minutes from now, I'm just, that's just not something I'll ever be able to master. So fortunately, I can come to a pretty firm conclusion that 20 or 30 years from now, America business, and probably over the world, will be far better than it is now. What are the momentary implications that you've seen from coronavirus? What's an example of a business? That's well, an example, uh, for example, we have maybe a thousand Dairy Queen uh, franchises in, 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 in uh, China here. And they're just treat only, so they're, they're the old, uh, older type, not with food. But a, 
a great number of them were closed, but the ones that were open weren't doing any business to speak of. And, and Apple is, I mean, our much bigger holding is Apple. We own 5.6% of Apple, and, and, and uh, the company came out and said that it's affecting not only its stores, but all kinds of things, supply chain. And I find that certain of our companies have got supply chain arrangements that are being affected by this that I didn't even know had those. Like what? Well, I got one uh, from John's Manville the other day, for example. You wouldn't normally think of them as having a big supply chain, but Shaw Carpets or you name it. I'll guarantee you that a very significant percentage of our business is one layer affected by it. But they're being affected by a lot of other things, too. And the real question is, is where are those businesses going to be in five or ten years? Sure. They'll have ups and downs. Our, our candy business is a wonderful business, but it loses money seven months out of the year. But the nice thing is Christmas comes every year. <laughs> When you look at the economy and how things were kind of chugging along, let's say, beginning of this year, yeah. when, when first things things first picked up, how would you gauge the U.S. economy at that well, point? Well, it, it's, it's strong, but a little softer than it was six months ago. But that's over a broad range of business. You look at car loadings, rail car loadings, that, that's moving goods around. And there again, that was affected by the tariffs, too, because people front-ended purchases, all kinds of things, always a lot of variables. But... Uh, Business is down, and and uh, but it's down from a very good level. Uh, so I would say that looking at our 70 businesses, and that actually they represent hundreds uh, in addition, uh, they're a little softer. Uh, on the other hand, I was out with the fellows from the Nebraska Furniture Mart just Saturday night, and and their business was up quite a bit in February, but that's because weather was good. <laughs> so you have a lot of variables that hit. Why why do you think? Business was down, let's say, the last six months. Is, is it a decline in confidence, or is it coming off of levels where there was unusual activity ahead of that? Well, it isn't really down. It's just it leveled off and a little softer maybe now. But, well, tariffs, the, the tariff situation was a big question mark for all kinds of companies and, and still is to some degree. But that, that was front and center for a while. Uh, uh, now coronavirus is front and center. Something else will be front and center six months from now and a year from now and two years from now. The real question is, is where, you're, where are these businesses going to be five and 10 and 20 years from now? Some of them will do sensationally. Some of them will disappear. And overall, I think America will do very well. It, it, you know, it has since 1776. But you still watch things like rail car loading oh, yeah. very closely. I watch everything. <laughs> but, but I don't do it to make in specific investment decisions. I, it, uh, uh, but I, I enjoy it. I mean, I, I, I want to know what's going on. But I also don't think that I can make money by predicting what's going to go on next week or next month. I do think I can make money by predicting what's going to happen in 10 years. All right. Well, tell us more about what's going on, just since you like knowing about those things. <laughs> <laughs> well, as I say, you know, the, the uh, certain businesses depend on weather to quite an extent in retail, for example, in given months. Uh, uh, but the big trends you see are going on. I mean, in terms of the movement to, to online commerce, and I mean, the, the big stuff uh, keeps moving. Uh, uh, but we've got a big investment in the airline business, and I just heard, you know, that even more flights are canceled and all that. But flights are canceled for weather. It so happens in this case, they're going to be canceled for longer because of uh, coronavirus. But if you own airlines for 10 or 20 years, you're going to have some of them ups and downs in current business, and some of them will be weather-related, and they can be all kinds of things. Uh, uh, the real question is, is, you know, how many passengers are they going to be carrying 10 years from now and 15 years from now, and what will margins be, and, and uh, what will the competitive position be? And But I still look at the figures all the time. <laughs> I, I'll admit that. <laughs> you, uh, you mentioned the airlines, and you own stakes in all of the major airlines, all but four. none as much as Delta. I think you own north of 11 percent of Delta at this point? Well, right at, we own the, our largest position is in Delta. Three of the four positions are mine. One of the positions is one of the other fellows uh, of the four positions. But we own a very roughly 10, close to 10 percent of, of uh, the four largest airlines. There's been a lot of speculation. In fact, some of the questions that came in over this weekend uh, were questions about those airlines, wondering if you would buy any of them outright. Have you considered buying any of those companies it, outright? Uh, it'd be very unlikely we would do that. I'm not saying it's impossible, but uh, it's complicated. Mm -hmm. Why? Well, for one thing, they're regulated, and there's an interplay. Uh, uh, 
I'll just give you an example, not that we'd be doing, but with Delta, we own 18% of American Express, and American Express is a bank holding company, and bank holding companies have limits as to what they can do, and we're a passive holder of a bank holding company with American Express, but then if we owned an airline that was tied up with them, they'd have lots of arrangements. There's, there's, a, there's a lot of complications, because it's a, it's a regulated industry. Anytime you get in a regulated industry, you have more complications in, 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 in transactions. So is it fair to say you like these stocks and you would own more if it, did, if it wasn't complicated? Well... We, if, to go beyond 15% in any company, we would have to go in on Hart Scott Rodino. I mean, there's a lot of rules as you increase your ownership. Obviously, almost anything we own, we'd like to own more of. Are you buying more of any of those stakes right now? Apple well, right. Uh, I get pretty close mouthed when it comes to what we're buying. <laughs> you <laughs> thought about that I for a second. I feel my jaws lock up. <laughs> But, but, fair to but say it's you. fair to say that anything that we own, we like. You know, and and uh, uh, there's very few stocks that we own. And I look at them as part ownerships in businesses. There, uh, uh, there's very few that are selling at some price where I would sell them a little higher. All right. Well, let me ask a question that came from Tony Dickinson. He said, in the fourth quarter, Berkshire sold 55 million shares of Wells Fargo. Should shareholders view this as a lack of confidence in the new CEO turnaround planned? And what is Warren's future outlook for Wells Fargo? Well, I won't give him any advice specifically on Wells Fargo, but it's absolutely true that we've sold down our position. Some of it was sold down to avoid uh, being over 10 percent, because then you do have some filings with the Fed and so on. But... Uh, they've we, sold we, well more than that. Yeah, we've sold, we've sold well uh, more than that. Yeah, I think 8.4% was the last. Yeah, that sounds right. And, and uh, no, we've, we've, uh, we've sold, we sold Wells Fargo in the fourth quarter and we sold it earlier. Can I ask why? Only because I, I did get a number of questions. I've yeah, well, I, I can understand that. But, yeah. but the, we, we just don't, we don't want to give any advice on what we're doing because I could change what I'm doing tomorrow at, uh, uh, now, the, we, we're, we talk about everything except st we don't give stock advice. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I'll try one more from okay. Tony Dickinson just because I, I think I got 15 or 20 different questions on this. Berkshire owns $32.58 billion of Bank of America and $17.39 billion of Wells Fargo. One position's been increasing while the other's been decreasing. Does Warren like Bank of America twice as much as Wells Fargo? And how should shareholders view the holdings? Yeah, well, I think they see that we've bought... We bought Bank of America and we sold some Wells Fargo. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let me ask you a broader question that comes in just on interest rates sure. and the impact that that might have as well. Varun J Jane writes in on Facebook, uh, Hi, I'm a huge fan and a student of Mr. Buffett. Please ask him what impact does the zero interest rate environment across places like Japan and Europe have on their banks, whether the business is still good, and does the prolonged low interest rate regime in the United States hurt, hurt the prospects of American banks like J.P. Morgan, et cetera? And in such circumstances, do Indian banks, which have high return on equity, look attractive to Mr. Buffett? Yeah, well, I, I, I can't comment on that. I, 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 but the, another, but the, generally speaking, with a lot of, but there are a lot of other variables too, but the, the banks are going to make more money if, there's, if there are higher rates with a with a steeper curve. Uh, the curve makes, is, is more important, in other words, the 10-year versus uh, short-term rates, uh, may make more difference than the ab absolute level. But American banks have made very good money with very low interest rates. Around the world, uh, uh, if you look in the UK or Europe uh, uh, or Japan, uh, even lower rates have made it pretty tough for banks. The, the returns uh, on equity are not as high, and they have to use more leverage uh, to even get the same returns, and I don't like that as well. Uh, if you are talking about the curve that we're looking at this morning, the five-year, two-year is inverted. Two-year yeah, 10 is not right now, but the 10 years below 1.4% this morning. And, th and think of the, the 10 year at 1.4%. That means you're paying 70 times earnings for, for something that can't increase its earnings for 10 years. Okay, now, somebody, told, if they, somebody came to you with a stock and said, you know, we, this is a terrific stock. It sells at 70 times earnings. The earnings can't go up for 10 years. Yeah, you, you'd say, well, explain that to me again. Right. <laughs> but 
No, the interest, the, we've never seen a situation like this in the world, literally. I mean, you can go back and read Keynes and you can read Adam Smith and you can read, you know, all the great ones. And they don't talk about negative interest rates. It never crossed their mind. Oh, supply and demand, all these are marginal costs. <laughs> but brilliant economists never really anticipated that you would have negative. And you've got 13 trillion or something like that worldwide at negative interest rates. And we don't know what that means. I mean, we've got a lot of people who can speculate what it means, but 10 years from now or 15 years from now, we'll look back and say, well, it's obvious what would happen under that and we'll, we'll see it. But it is not a normal situation and it's, it's uh, uh, well, interest rates are the basis of all value. I mean, you know, it, uh, uh, if, if you knew interest rates were gonna be zero for 100 years, you would think 1% was a great rate to ret of return. But you also would know if you bought something that was yielding 1% or that was what it paid and rates went to 8%, you'd lose practically all your capital. So it's an enormous factor and we don't know the answer. Central banks don't know the answer. Uh, all we know is that uh, it, it's been useful in stimulating things and particularly asset prices now for 10 years and what we thought was temporary in 2008 and 9 in the way of monetary policy to stimulate we've just put our foot on the gas even further the whole world has you made a point in the letter of saying that you don't know how long these interest rates will last right. you and charlie never try and never. figure these things out but we did have st louis fed president uh, jim bullard on the program last week and he said that he expects to see these low interest rates for a long time to come. That does raise a lot of questions, if that happens, about what this means for the stock market, what that means for banks, what that means for insurance companies, which you touched on in the letter, too. It's bad for insurance companies, but it's, it's, it's good for stocks. Bad for insurance companies. And what happens to the insurance companies as a result? Are they getting more? Well, are, are some they, insurance companies kind of pushing well, what, out well, risk? The ones that really get hurt on it are... are are either life or annuity companies that have promised returns. The property casualty business doesn't promise returns. It still holds money, so it hurts them. But if you promise somebody an annuity that's going to pay them three or four percent, and now you find that you're reinvesting your money at one percent or something, uh, uh, you know, you're going to disappear. <laughs> are insurance companies being forced to make riskier and riskier bets? Well, they, they shouldn't be. I mean, the answer, if if you need to get 3% and you're only getting 1%, the answer is to quit giving 3%. It's not to try and get the one up to three and do more dangerous things. You should always adapt your consumption to your income. You shouldn't try and adjust your income to your consumption. <laughs> That's a basic principle for individuals, businesses, and everything else. And reaching for yield is really stupid. But it's very human. I mean, and I understand it. Uh, and people say, well, I've saved all this money all my life, and now I can only get 1% on it. What do I do? And the answer is you learn to live on 1%, unfortunately. And, and uh, you don't go and listen to some salesman come along and tell you, I've got some magic way to get you 5%. Do you think, though, I, that that's what should be happening? Do you think that there is more risk taking place in the insurance sure. market as well? and you see that in... You see that in, 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 in what they call leverage loans and weaker covenants and all. No, people are reaching for yield. There's no question about that. And that's stupid. And it, it has consequences over time. Uh, uh, but it's very human. Consequences that could have a big market impact? Depends how far it goes. Yeah. Yeah. It's, the, it's, it's something that the things that get built in slowly, people going crazy in, in tech companies in the late 1990s, it, it can take a lot longer than you think. Mm -hmm. But eventually you get to midnight and everything turns to pumpkins and mice. You know, that, that's the downside of yeah. low interest rates, pensions, savers, anybody who gets left in a raw position of that. Uh, on the alternate side of things, if rates were to rise rapidly, or not, maybe not even so rapidly, mm -hmm. what does that mean for the federal debt? Well, it, it depends on the average maturity of the debt, but our maturities are fairly short. They've gotten lengthened a little. But, but if you take you know, 20 trillion or, and, and you're borrowing at, at 2%, you've got, you've got 400, uh, 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 what have you got, a two, 2 trillion, 200 billion, you've got 40 billion of, of the expense. But if it 
goes to 5%, you got 100 billion of expense. I mean, it, uh, uh, no, at 5%, you got, a, you got a trillion of expense, I'm sorry. It's, uh, we are benefiting enormously in our national budget by the fact that interest rates are very low. Uh, and, and so interest cost has not gone up as you would have anticipated if you were looking at the scene 20 or 30 years ago with the increase in national debt. Uh, you know, Austria issued 100-year bonds, you know, at, at 2% or thereabouts, and then they've gone way, way up. And, and I think maybe they yield 1.1 or something like that. I, I don't know where they are now. But uh, it's great if you're a borrower to have cheap money. I mean, everybody should refinance their mortgage. <laughs> Is that an argument for the Federal Reserve, or I'm sorry, for the Treasury Department here, issuing longer longer notes? Well, like yeah, but I would have said the same thing five or six years ago and been wrong. Uh, but... Uh, if, if we, under the present slope, it still would cost more to lengthen it out, but you're lengthening it out at very, very low rates, and it would be what I would be inclined to do if I were uh, Secretary of Treasury, but I'd have missed a lot of bets in the last <laughs> 10 years, too. Warren, again, for people who are just waking sure. up, they're tuning in and they want to know what you think about this sell-off this morning, to see the Dow down 700, 800 points in the morning. Yeah. What's your reaction when you see something like that? Well, my reaction is that I like to buy stocks, so I uh, I don't wish ill on anybody else, but I like to, if they want to sell them to be cheaper, I, I prefer it. <laughs> so, uh, if that's a... Uh, you know, roughly a 3% decline or thereabouts. I don't know how many 3% declines I've had in my lifetime, but there have been a lot of them. And uh, I, I can't think of one that you shouldn't have bought on, you know, <laughs> basically. That doesn't mean stocks are going to go up or down next week or next month or next year. But, but if, if there's something, if you like to own American businesses, you're getting a chance to buy it 3% cheaper. I don't consider that a lot cheaper. I mean, but, but, but. How can it be bad news unless you have to sell stocks? Now, if you have to sell them for some reason, it's, you're worse off. If you don't have to sell them, I mean, somebody can come around and offer you a quote on your house today, and it could be 2% less than they offered you yesterday. But if you like the house, it really doesn't make any difference to you. Does that mean Berkshire will be buying stocks today? It's, it's, it, well, we certainly won't be selling. And, and yeah, we, may, we could easily be buying something, sure. Okay. Uh, let's talk a little bit about a Barron's cover story that was just out mm -hmm. last week. Uh, the good news on the cover story is they think the Berkshire is worth more than it's selling for right now. Mm -hmm. The bad news is they said they think that's in part because it, there's, it's got a big conglomerate discount, and they think if you weren't running it, that it might get broken up. What, what's your response to that line of logic? Well, conglomerates have had a bad name, and for good reason over the years. I mean, I, I closed my partnership up at the end of the 1960s. And there was a run, a very abusive run in conglomerates where they played with numbers and they had dirty pooling, as they called it, of accounting. They, they wanted to have their stocks up and put out stories to do it so they could issue more stock. They were kind of chain letter arrangements. There have been, been a lot of bad conglomerates and probably disproportionately so compared to sort of honest to God single industry businesses over time. Uh, uh, we don't think we're that kind of a conglomerate. <laughs> We've certainly never wanted to issue shares. We've never touted shares. We, you know, and it, it, it's, it's, it's done for business reasons in our case. The interesting thing is, of course, is the American public has been going wild in their enthusiasm for conglomerates in the last few years, if you think about it. I mean, it's been an incredibly popular area. But... They call them index funds. Oh. You, buy, you buy 500 <laughs> businesses. I'm trying to figure out what you were talking about. Yeah, yeah, well, 500 businesses all put together. I mean, that's the ultimate conglomerate, isn't it? I right. mean, I, I've recommended index funds to lots of people, and when they do it, they're buying into 500 businesses. And uh, they're going to have 500 businesses a year from now and five years from now, and they think that group of businesses that will do very well, and I think our group of businesses will do okay. The difference with an S&P 500 index is it's 500 different companies run by 500 different management teams who are all focused on their business, maybe not having a centralized operation that is loosely running all of those businesses. Well, we've got... Our businesses are run by separate people. I mean, I... I uh, we just finished Valentine's Day, and I, I did not... I did not select what pieces went in the boxes. <laughs> and and uh, it's been... Probably been 10 years at least since I've been to a C's Candry 
factory. Now, you know, I get the figures every month, but I, I don't have, I don't know how to make chocolate. <laughs> I think of the sort, I don't pick out the new locations. We, we have managers for our businesses that are very much like the managers we have for the businesses that we own pieces of, like American Express or Coca-Cola. And uh, there's a couple things we can do. We can determine the dividend policy of our subsidiaries. Mm -hmm. uh, we can control their capital allocation to some extent, but on, on most capital allocation, whether to buy new equipment or anything like that, they make the decision. The, the BNSF Railroad is gonna spend three and a half billion dollars on, I, I don't, I don't approve a single dollar of that in terms of capital expenditures. They, they know what they need to do, or they need to lay track, how many locomotives they need, whatever it may be. So our managers are, I would say in a sense, they're almost more independent uh, than the managers of the S&P 500 who go around and report to Wall Street week after week. They go to investor relations meeting and they're always explaining what they're doing and trying to get the approval of the analysts and all that sort of thing. And, and we just tell our managers to do what makes sense. Okay, outside of the idea of them not having to report to individual shareholders or the investment community, what's the advantage of having you there? The capital allocation part of it? Well, we can, yeah, we can move capital within. If you move capital from one stock to another, and you got a game, particularly, I mean, you pay a tax and, and uh, may pay a dividend tax or if you sell, uh, but there's a, there's a, a lot of taxes incurred in moving from one business to another, either at the corporate level, uh, in some cases, uh, but certainly at the individual level. And uh, we can move capital, well, just take C's Candy again. We bought that in 1972. We've moved uh, several billion dollars from the candy business to uh, other types of businesses. And uh, we'd love it if we could use it all in the candy business, but it just isn't that sort of business. And in, in addition to that, uh, uh, we free up our managers from all dealing with Wall Street, dealing with bankers, dealing with all kinds of things that are, are what I regard as less productive use of their time. However, you also have a situation where you have gotten some activists who have been interested in the stock, including Bill Ackman. Um, he's built up a stake, hasn't said too much about it, but I think he has made some comments about how maybe Burlington, Northern Santa Fe's margins could be improved. You can look back at Bill Ackman's experience with the Canadian Pacific Railway and kind of wonder if he is building up a position because he would like to see you take a more active role there. Well, we, we notice what other railroads earn and when their margins are better. I mean, and uh, we, we certainly put way less pressure on than Wall Street might, who would want it next week or... But uh, we, uh, our managers are well aware of what's going on in other industries, and, and we've made changes where we don't think some businesses are performing as well as they should. But overwhelmingly, we've got managers there that are very, very good. They've got capital available to them for anything that makes sense. And we decide how much they distribute, uh, where the capital moves, and sometimes it moves from one industry to another. And, in certain industries, uh, a consolidated tax position really is very helpful to us. There's a viewer question that came in from Ben Comston, and he asks, uh, it was recently pointed out by Bill Ackman that some subsidiaries like Geico, BNSF, lag their peers in some areas. Would you agree with that? And how can your success or push improvement in subsidiaries while maintaining a decentralized management structure? Well, at Geico, we bought control in 1995. Uh, we had about two and a half percent of the market for auto insurance, and we're at about 13.7 percent of the market. So we've gone from two and a half billion of premium volume, or thereabouts, to 35 billion of premium volume. Uh, we're number two now to State Farm. We were number six or seven at that time. So I would say that not due to Berkshire at all, but due to Tony Nicely uh, during almost all those years. Uh, Geico has been the envy of every other company in the uh, auto insurance business, except for Progressive, but they've done a good job too. <laughs> but I, I, Geico uh, is worth tens and tens and tens of billions more than when we bought it, in addition to all the earnings we've given, just the goodwill value side. It, uh, uh, that's been extraordinarily well run. And with Burlington, we... I think we paid a dividend of five billion last year, and we paid thirty-five billion for it. So, it, it, uh, uh, 
it's gained in market share uh, in its business. Its operating margins have improved, but they haven't improved as much as some other railroads. Uh, Do you believe in precision scheduling railroading? Well, we'll see. I mean, we've, we've watched it plenty. And, 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 and for those who don't know what that is, it's something that kind of irritates customers because it makes things a little more rigid, but it doesn't. Yeah, it, it makes the customers adapt to the railroad more than the railroad adapting to the customers. And practically everybody's done it. And a fellow uh, named Hunter Harrison was enormously successful. Who he worked with Bill Ackman at the Canadian Pacific. Yeah, he worked for the back BNSF back. if you go yeah. back far enough. Uh, he, and there's a book about him. It's very interesting. But he's a, he did it at the Illinois Central, the Canadian National, the Canadian Pacific, and then he was going over to the CSX. He, 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 he developed a method of railroading where the customer does adapt more to the, uh, to the uh, railroad, and it improved margins dramatically. Our margins are close to what uh, the, the better railroads, uh, well, there's only a few, uh, get from precision railroading. On the other hand, we've gained share. Uh, because the customers don't like because, it. Because uh, the railroads apparently, or the railroad customers like us better. And over the, over the long term, we'll see. But it isn't like it's something we can't do. And here's the latest on the coronavirus. China reported an additional 150 deaths and 409 new cases overnight. South Korea raised its coronavirus alert to the highest level after the number of cases there balloon from 31 to more than 750 in less than a week. Stocks uh, in Asia falling overnight. Hong Kong's Hang Seng uh, fell 1.8 percent. South Korea's Kospi fell nearly 3.9 percent. Shares of uh, South Korea's two largest airlines down uh, as they canceled flights to the city of Daegu, where many of the new cases were detected. Meantime, Italy's government is scrambling to deal with the biggest outbreak of the coronavirus outside of Asia. Uh, stocks there were lower uh, overnight. The government placed at least 10 towns in northern Italy uh, under quarantine and canceled the last few days of the Venice Carnival. Elsewhere in Italy, schools, museums, universities, and cinemas were closed, and major soccer uh, matches were canceled. Um, at this point, I, I mean, Boris Johnson out earlier today, Andrew, saying that the risk to UK citizens just over there remains low. I would say that. Our, our officials would say that here, too. The yes. risk to the U.S. citizens remains low. Mm -hmm. But there's a significant difference between um, supply chain disruption slowing dozens and dozens and actually hundreds Absolutely. of companies. Absolutely. And, and that's dampening global growth. What worries me is that we don't know, three, three months, six months, nine months, if it ever gets to the point where we start to see, the, in a lot of countries around the world, these, uh, these break. Uh, outs where they don't even know the origin right. of some of these. And if they multiply right. like that, that's when I think it could really get... Uh, at this point, it's, no, still that, a, it's still a global growth slowdown. Nobody in, in most of the world is worried that they're going to catch coronavirus right. and they can't go out and they can't you know, go to the movies or the health club or to a restaurant. But that, I, I just wonder, well, look, we don't are, know. There are major travel that's being changed right now. Conferences yeah. are being canceled. There was an article in Time Magazine speculating when the, whether the Olympics in Japan over the summer uh, will be canceled. So there, there's real implications here that could re reverberate. Having said that, the farther we get to the spring, the better it gets in terms of weather. There's a whole sort of view and, about, and, about how the flu uh, you know, uh, you know, I was sense. looking at Jim's, some of Jim's tweets earlier. If, if you go too far with, with, with the, the, the fear and the panic, you're accused of one thing. If yep. you don't go far enough, yep. you're accused of the other thing. So we really just need to sit here and, and each day report on the facts and try to remain attached. But there's something, something about a pandemic that just is different than other black swans. It's, it's, it's a frightening uh, prospect. Anyway, let's get right uh, back to our guest of the morning. Warren Buffett joins uh, Becky in Omaha following the re release of his uh, annual letter to shareholders uh, over the weekend. Uh, I mean, Becky, you took a plane. I mean, I, we, it's in the back of our minds, is it <laughs> not? It's just in the back. There's no way. And, it is. and the, the risks I, are low. So it goes back to 1918. It goes right. back to 1980. And if you look at the numbers of what happened in that pandemic when it came around the globe, up to 50 million people were killed in that. It was a third of the planet's population that was infected. It was 500 million people that were infected at that point. 
675,000 Americans died at that point. So un inevitably, uh, your mind kind of goes back to what's happened in the past, because as humans, we always look back to history to try and predict the future. It doesn't always work. It's not always uh, prophetic, but it does give you something of what to kind of play out if this were to get worse and worse. Now, Andrew brought up the idea that it's warm weather. We're approaching spring in a lot of parts of the country, or a lot of parts of the planet. That may be good news. We just don't know if this time around, if this is one of those viruses that that does die off in warmer weather. Wait and see and kind of hope. Yeah, Warm's actually, um, uh, I think this, from what I've heard from people that know a lot more about viruses than I do, that 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 uh, unfortunately this will make it through the summer. And and in terms of having a vaccine, it's you know a long ways off. So. Uh, you've got, uh, you know, it is scary stuff. Uh, I don't think it should affect what you do in stocks, but uh, but it, in, in terms of in terms of the human race, it's scary stuff when you have a pandemic. Yeah, I, I guess this one's particularly frightening because it's new. Uh, so there's no natural immunity that's built up in any of the populations, and you wonder what happens, particularly in areas where there's not the same health care structure that we have in America or in some of the developed nations. I, I guess that's a big part of the question too. Yeah. Um, and it's it's uh, well, I, I think about it in terms of our annual meeting. I mean, it, which is May May second. I mean, it it uh, it could very well affect by that time. It could affect. Uh, we, we've got questions from viewers asking just that: Will the annual meeting be any different this year? Particularly because you have a large uh, Chinese contingency of shareholders. Yeah, I don't think. That. Yeah, and that certainly will be affected. And and uh, and incidentally, I mean, flu is particularly tough on old people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you're going to have two guys on the stage whose combined age is 185, so <laughs> well, we'll, we'll, uh, we, we won't be looking for people that are showing any signs of contagion. <laughs> but that's one of the problems with this is that it does have a long gestation period, that, that, right. uh, and, and it's highly transmissible. And again, you did talk about it earlier. It's something that you see in the results of the businesses, it's even true. some of your own fully owned sure. businesses that you didn't anticipate. Well, and we own airlines, for example. No, it, it affects businesses. Now, actually, my dad used to tell me story. He was 14 in 1918, and he, he, he told me what went on in Omaha you know, during the big Spanish flu epidemic. I mean, it, it, was, it was something in those days. And, uh, and pandemics will occur in the in the future now what they hope to get is is a universal flu vaccine but that's a long way off it isn't impossible i mean i asked my my own science advisor is bill gates so i talked to him i call him i've talked to him the last few days about uh, about it and uh, he's bullish on the long term outlook for a a, a universal uh, uh uh prevention of it but but uh he says it's not going to come you know for it's not going to be here in 10 years. What are, what are Bill's concerns as somebody who spends a lot of time traveling around the globe, as somebody who is trying to help medicine in some of the less developed parts of the world? Yeah, the Gates Foundation is, is very active in trying to be helpful on this. And, and Bill says the CDC is the best in the world. And, and I mean, we've got terrific resources in this country, but a pandemic is a pandemic. And, and uh, uh, there's just no evaluating but I have heard that the summer is not likely to cause the end of this. Do you know why? But I don't know. And, and you know, you shouldn't be asking. I, I, I shouldn't be offering my opinion on that because I, I, I pass along things I hear from people I think are smart. But but I'm actually asking for Bill's opinion, not yours. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, uh, well, I shouldn't and I shouldn't really quote him. But I do. I, he's the guy I ask. I, and I did talk to him just a few days ago. And uh, uh, he loves to talk science, and he, he can make it so I can understand it, which is a, quite a trick. Uh, um, you know, at, at the Gates Foundation, they're taking it very seriously. I'll put it that way. Is money going from the Gates Foundation to try and I'm, find a I'm, vaccine? I'm sure we are expending human and financial resources. Have I, I mean, maybe this is more than you know, but you know if they have put human resources out either into China or other places where there's... I don't know that. I don't want to comment on that. But I know that they're... That, that is uh, something they've always spent... Uh, they've been very involved in is human health and, 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 and even particularly this. Bill knows a lot about vaccines. Okay. 
Let, let's talk a little bit about Berkshire Hathaway. We were in the middle of a conversation when we had to go to a break before. But there has been this question raised, uh, not only by Barron's in the cover story there, but by other places, too, uh, about whether Berkshire Hathaway would be worth more if it were split up. That's a, that's a good question, and I will tell you that, that if you were to say, and let's say the stock market didn't change for two years and interest rates didn't change, so you had a two-year period and you said, we'll sell off all the businesses. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I don't think... I mean, you have the expenses of selling them. Now, if you sold them all to people who leveraged them up to their maximum, you might get a little more than the stock is selling for. It would be very tax inefficient, very tax inefficient. Interestingly enough, up till 1986, it wouldn't have been. I mean, there was a general utilities doctrine that governed uh, corporate breakups. And uh, so you could dispose of businesses or securities if you did it right, you could dispose of securities or businesses that had appreciated without a tax at the corporate level. That was done regularly in various ways up till 1986. They revised the tax code big time. They killed general utilities. And you can't do that now. Now, you can go, you can have spinoffs, this business or that business. You probably have to lie a little in terms of your purpose in order to get the best tax ruling. Uh, and it takes time, but you cannot break up you cannot dispose of the entire business, uh, business by business, without having very substantial tax liability. It would not produce a gain. On the other hand, having them together produces, there, there's some very valuable synergies in there. Now, we don't use leverage as much as the people who would buy them piece by piece would do. So we could leverage Berkshire up to the sky. I promise people we won't because we have insurance promises to people out 50 or 100 years, and we've got shareholders who are going to own the stock for 50 years, and they do not want us to, uh, to leverage to the sky. But uh, there would not be a profit if, uh, if we were simply to announce that over the next 24 months that you could come in and buy any business we had, and we'd sell them to the highest bidder. You made a point of talking about this in the annual letter. Uh, yeah. You said... Key to my only Berkshire, or key to my Berkshire only institutions is my faith in the future judgment and fidelity of Berkshire directors. They will regularly be tested by Wall Streeters bearing fees. At many companies, these super salesmen might win. I do not, however, expect this to happen. That's in exactly true, and, and I think by writing it, it helps it a little too. <laughs> uh, no, there's no question that that. Wall Street would love to come along and sell anything that we've got. I mean, you know, there's a fee every time that there's a transaction, and, and they're big fees, and, and there's fees for financing. I mean, there's, and so we've had all kinds of, of people snoop around that. And they know they're not getting it done with me, but they're not, they won't, it won't get done later on either. I, I am leaving every, every share of Berkshire I have goes to charity, and it's 99% of my net worth. So I got... Nobody cares more than I do about getting the most money to those philanthropies over the, over the years following my deaths. And that's going to take place over 15 years, and I say keep it all in Berkshire. But if I thought that it was going to be run uh, in a way responsive to, to Wall Street, I would, I would instead do something else and, and, and have, the, have the money distributed to these philanthropies and not have it all tied to Berkshire. But Berkshire has a very unusual shareholder base. I mean, we have individuals that own Berkshire, and a lot of them have owned it 50 years just like that. It, it's, people buy it to own for, for a lifetime, and, and uh, uh, we're going to run it in a way that they won't be disappointed. Do you think the people who are newer, relatively newer shareholders buying the B shares have the same mentality as the people who have been in it for 50 years in the A Well, we try to shares. because that's who we encourage. I mean, in effect... We don't want everybody to buy our stock. I mean, there's only so many seats. There's about a million six hundred and some thousand A shares out. All the seats are filled. I love the shareholders we have. I don't want to go to Wall Street and try and get some new shareholders. They're going to replace the people we have. So uh, what we want to have is people in those seats that are in sync with us. You can run a French restaurant or you can run a, a hamburger stand. And if you serve good hamburgers, you'll do good business with the hamburger stand. You can at the at French restaurant, you do the same thing there. But you can't run the French restaurant and then serve hamburgers inside, and you can't run the hamburger stand and serve French, uh, French food inside. So we advertise in our deeds, in our words, in every way we can, what we're about. And we're looking to have the seats filled in our church 
by people who are in sync with us, and we do have them there. We get the same people every Sunday. And I see no advantage in going out and telling everybody in Wall Street we're going to do wonderful things and having those seats replaced, because the only way you can get a seat is to throw somebody else out of that seat. There's only so many seats, and they're all full, and you want them filled with people who are in sync with the, with the policies of the company, and therefore you have to explain those policies and you have to live up to those policies and for 55 years we've tried to. So you get the shareholders you deserve. Exactly. All right, not to mix metaphors, but can you have a decentralized central office running both the French restaurant and the hamburger place? Well, they aren't trying, we're not trying to have the railroad management run uh, the utility here. No, the we're decentralized, that's what I mean, a decentralized headquarters that's in charge, a conglomerate in charge of all those different businesses. Well, you, we could run well, we have decentralized management as it is. Uh, we could have somebody in charge of all the little companies, another one for the big. I mean, we could divisionalize it in all kinds of ways. Uh, I think we'd have more overhead. I think we'd have a different sort of manager. Our managers like running their own businesses, and they they like they never have to finance their businesses. I mean, you know, we they never have to go to Wall Street. They never. They probably save 25 percent of their time, yeah. and uh, uh, and I want them to feel they own their businesses, and that's all they're responsible for. If we mess up some other way, you know, they still they get paid based on how they do, and and uh, uh, there again we attract managers who like to operate on that basis. We don't attract managers, particularly who, who think they're going to keep moving step by step through various divisions and eventually run the whole place. One of the things that, that, that people wrote in, a lot of people had questions about the banks, about what's happening with the banks, what you've changed with some of your um, investments over time. Jason Goldberg writes in, he says, please ask Warren about his views on the bank stocks in general and on Wells Fargo in particular. Over the last two quarters, he sold almost a quarter of his longstanding uh, Wells Fargo stake. Also in the fourth quarter, he dumped a third of his Goldman, stock, uh, Goldman Sachs shares, although he still owns over $75 billion in bank equities. So what do you think about banks, uh, not necessarily the sell-off today because you don't look at day by day? Well, banking is a good business if you don't do dumb things on the asset side. I mean, basically. And uh, it's... It, 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 it's a business that uh, the banks we own earn between uh, the commercial banks earn between 12 percent and 16 percent or so uh, on tangent net tangible assets. That's a good business. It's a fantastic business against the long-term bond. Uh, you know, at two percent, uh, if you have a choice between a two percent instrument and a 12 percent instrument, which one's going to win over time? So, so. If you ask me whether I think uh, uh, banks are going to go down where they only earn 3 or 4% on tangible assets, I don't think that will happen. The question is really whether they do something massively dumb, I mean, which periodically a number of banks have done. And I, 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 I feel very good about the banks we own. I, they're, they're very attractive compared to most other securities I see. And, and most of them are buying, Bank of America is buying in a lot of stock every year. So our ownership of the Bank of America this year probably will go up 7 or 8 percent without us spending a dime. Uh, I, I'd like to own any business, any good business where my ownership is up 7 or 8 percent every year without me spending any money and on top of it I get a dividend and so on. It, they're, very, they're very attractive both against interest rates and against uh, uh, or against bonds and against other stocks, in my view. You say occasionally they do dumb things. Uh, maybe you're talking about Wells Fargo with the scandal that it had. It just settled uh, on Friday with a number of the regulatory institutions that were kind of looking into it, the investigations that were taking place for $3 billion. Yeah. Does this mean that they have kind of finally gotten through that and can move forward? I don't know the answer to that. I know that they made $3 billion because it was announced. I don't know what else is outstanding. But... Wells Fargo's classic in, in, in terms of one lesson. Uh, my partner, Charlie Munger, you know, he's, you know, he says, whenever we have a problem, you attack it immediately. He says an ounce of, perversion is, uh, an ounce of prevention is not worth a pound of cure. An ounce of prevention is worth a ton of cure. And we've seen that time after time. And the interesting thing, I, 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 and I don't know the details at all, but the original thing was a bunch of, whole bunch of phony accounts. Now, I don't know how, if you open up a couple million phony accounts, you make any money on it at all. 
I mean, I don't. The shareholders didn't make money. People say that. Well, the, people, well, the incentive the, structure was set up so that some of the employees didn't make money. It was the dumbest incentive money. system you can think. And as soon as you learn, you can devise dumb incentive systems. We've done them ourselves. I mean, you can you can cause people to do the wrong thing because they will do what they're incented to do, and they had a obviously a very dumb incentive system. People started playing it various ways, and the big thing is they ignored ignored it when they found out about it. I mean, you. you you're going to do dumb things in business, and we do them every day, you know. But the, the, you absolutely have to attack a problem as soon as it occurs and you, and you know about it. And if that had happened, Wells Fargo shareholders would be a lot better off. But Wells Fargo, Fargo shareholders did not, did not profit from opening up accounts that were phony accounts that had nothing in them. I mean, somebody was getting paid so much per account, so that, and the practice spread because bad practices do spread if they're allowed to spread. And they were ignored, which is t a total disaster. And, and look at the consequences. So two or three years later, who's paying? The shareholders are paying for something that didn't do them any good whatsoever. Is that why you've sold off some of the shares? No, that, that, not specifically. I know you don't want to get specific on why. Yeah, no, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not recommending it. It's what stocks, uh, people have to make up their own minds on that. But, uh. Okay. I, I want to ask you a question um, about Todd Combs and his new role at GEICO. I got yeah. several questions that came in from that, and let's just use this one from Peter Lampras. Uh, during last year's interview on CNBC, after the 2018 letter was released, you were asked about succession at GEICO, and you mentioned that at a recent meeting at GEICO, you met about 40 of their top executives, and after each introduced themselves, they stated their length of time with the company. The shortest was 19 years. Please explain why none of these 40 top executives were qualified to take over as CEO after the retirement of Bill Roberts. Uh, again, that's Pete Lamparis from Chicago. Yeah, Bill Roberts uh, took over uh, not even two years ago. And last, and he th has done a terrific job in connection with Tony nicely. I mean, Geico is my first love, uh, absolutely. <laughs> I, I, I tell the other companies that. You, you can't you can compete for my second love, but you can't compete for my first love, which is Geico, because it goes back 60. 69 years, and it, it did wonders for me. Anyway, uh, Geico, uh, Bill Roberts took over a little less than two years ago, and then in Oct either October or November last year, he said he would, he, he'd like to retire in a year. He would adjust it in any way that made it the easiest for us. And, and uh, 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 we did not have the person, uh, uh, in my view, uh, to replace him at that point, and Todd Combs, who's worked with Berkshire now for 10 years, he actually was a product manager at Progressive in the past, and he knows a lot about insurance. Insurance is probably the only business I know something about that we're in, all the rest of them are total confusion. But uh, I, I understand the insurance business to some degree. Todd understands it very well at the operating level. And so Todd is there, and I hope very much that, uh, that he's not there very long, because I'd like to get him back to Omaha. Uh, but uh, our intention uh, always is to promote from within, and uh, we would hope to have, pick out the right person at, at, at GEICO. It isn't that there isn't somebody there, it's just you want to have the right one, because when you put somebody in, you're going to keep them there for a long time, and, and, uh, or her. And, uh, Does that suggest Todd is not going to be there for a long time? I don't think he's going to. No, no, the plan is not for him to be. I mean, he has not made a permanent career shift, uh, and uh, uh, he, you know, I don't, I don't know how long he'll be there. We have, we have one important problem, which is, uh, which all insurance companies have, but Progressive has done a better job of, of, of managing uh, of 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 uh, uh, correlating or uh, risk with uh, uh, with rate, and that uh, is what we're focused on now. Correlating uh, risk with rate. Meaning. In other words, having the proper rate. Right, uh, charging and, the right amount. For charging the right amount. If you were in the life insurance business, and you thought that 80-year-olds had the same life expectancy as 20-year-olds, old, you'd have a big big problem. And what would happen is you'd write all the 80-year-olds, and somebody would write all the 20-year-olds. So. In auto insurance, the same thing. There's a vast in, in difference. Auto insurance, I'm not sure. I, I might prefer the 80 year olds over the 20 year olds. Well, you might, and uh, you, you certainly would prefer the 80 year olds to the 16 year olds. I mean, right. yeah, yeah it's, uh, and you'd prefer the 16 year old female to the 16 year old male. Right. There's a whole bunch of things. Uh, uh, 
So you've got to core, you really got to segment risks, and that's enormously important. Uh, and every company's trying to do it better all the time. We do it far better than we did 50 years ago, but uh, we have room for improvement on that. We're focused on that. And in the meantime, we're growing faster than we're gaining market share. We, Geico is a fantastic asset. Todd's job is to focus on that, but it's also to work himself out of a job very, very quickly, and, and preferably to work, definitely preferably to work himself out of a job with, with somebody from Geico. Uh, Eric LaFont writes a follow-up question. He says, Warren, why did you and Ajit decide to appoint Todd Combs as the CEO of Geico? That part you've answered, yeah. but how will he be able to run Geico, manage a $13 billion investment portfolio, oversee Haven, and be on the board of J.P. Morgan? Yeah, well, let's... It'll keep him busy, and we're and we've told him he's unlimited use of a net jets. <laughs> really? Oh, sure. <laughs> no, I mean we want him to be efficient. That's what net jets is for, and and and, uh, uh, and he, you know, he'll be working seventy-hour weeks. The the question about the portfolio is interesting. Most months, neither Ted nor Todd makes a single change in their portfolio. I mean, portfolio management is something that you learn over decades. And when I ran Solomon, I, you know, I was running Berkshire portfolio. It, it is not something that you have to sit there day by day and do. Uh, people do it that way, but uh, if there, there are many years where if I just left the portfolio entirely the same and didn't make any changes, we'd be better off. So it, it, it that's not about. But but you're, you're right in terms of J.P. Morgan's board and he's he's going to be a very busy guy. Geico's the top priority, but it isn't going to say the top priority. Uh, for a long, long time. All right, let me run to another question that Max0205 wrote in. Um, have Todd Combs and Ted Weschler outperformed the S&P 500 since they began working at Berkshire? Uh, why don't you disclose their record? Why, why don't I? Why don't you disclose their record, they said. Well, we're not disclosing. Uh, I, I, I think it would be very unusual uh, well, for a firm to discover, uh, disclose everybody's sales last year among their salespeople or anything yeah. like that. I mean, they're, they're entitled to work <laughs> uh, uh, in relative anonymity. Uh, our directors know how they do. I know how they do. We made a lot of money with them. I feel very good. I mean, I feel very good about them in all ways. But we're not going to we're not going to tell you how much each candy store sells. It <laughs> sees candy or who was the top the top person at. Uh, uh, at any place brought in in sales or whatever it may be. All right, let, let's jump to Berkshire's overall record versus yeah. the S&P. Berkshire has now underperformed the S&P 500 on one-year, three-year, five-year, and 10-year marks. Yeah. Is that because it's too big, and will it ever be able to outperform the Well, certainly being too big is part of it. Uh, and, uh, but I would say this. Uh, during that same time, I mean, last year, we achieved, now, I don't like it, gap earnings very well, but we achieved the highest gap earnings of any company in the world has ever achieved uh, that's investor-owned, and we have the highest net worth of any company in the world investor-owned, any company in the world. So it, I would say related to safety of principle over time, uh, I, I feel good about it, and I feel good about the fact that 99% of my money's in it and that it will be the source of all the philanthropic contributions that are made for 15 or dozen years after I die. So, uh, but I don't think, I do not think it will be in the top 10% of stocks performing over the next 10 years. I don't think it'll be in the top 15% of stocks performing in the next 10 or 15 years. I also don't think it'll be in the bottom 10% or 20% or 30%. So, but our ability to have a huge edge over the market generally with a 550 billion dollar market value. It, 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 it's just, it, it, it'll be minor, but it'll be done in a very, very safe manner. Is an investment in the S&P 500 a better investment it than could a be. It could be. Uh, uh, you know, on balance, I think we'll do a little better, but it'll be, it'll be minor. It depends on the kind of market we're in. If we're in a down market, we're, we're going to beat it. I mean, it's that simple. Uh, and sometimes we will be. The last 10 years, we haven't been. Uh, but, uh, over 55 years, it's worked, and, and it, it will continue working, but it, it will not work at all like it did 
when we were working with a hundred million dollars or a billion dollars. There's no question about that. But we've got good businesses, and we're we won't be in the bottom quartile. I promise you that <laughs> over any long period of time. There are people like there were back in 1999 who have said, maybe you've lost your edge. It was a similar thing at the, in 1999 where you saw the technology stocks that were the big high flyers that uh, people were pouring their money into, the dot-com companies and a lot of others associated with that. If you look at the markets again, it's the technology companies that have the big runs. This time you're participating in, in Apple, which is one of those front runners. But is this a cyclical thing to you? You think there'll be another market downturn and then Berkshire outperforms? Oh, there'll be a downturn sometime. And, be a big... and then Berkshire outperforms at that point? Or? Oh, we'll outperform in a down market, but but that may not be <laughs> particularly satisfactory to, <laughs> to people. But, no, we will because we have these businesses that are making money. And, that, I mean, we are, we are not, we're geared somewhat away from a full market participation on, in either direction. Uh, but that's fine. We own, if you think about it, we're 80-some percent in equities. Uh, we may so show 230 or 40 billion in equities, and that looks like we're against our market cap. We're 40 percent, but we own 100 percent of these other businesses. Those are equities, too. I mean, we own a railroad, <laughs> and we own insurance companies, and those are, those are equities. So we're about 80 percent in, roughly, in equities and about 20 percent in cash, and I'd rather, I'd rather have that 20 percent in other good businesses, but... but uh, uh, that is to some extent a curse of size, and it's to some extent the fact that that uh, it's very hard. If interest rates stay at this level, we'll wish we for the next ten or twenty years. We'll wish we'd been one hundred and twenty-five percent in equities. I mean, it, it, you know, equities are so much cheaper than bonds, long bonds, that uh, you know, some something will change in a major way. I just don't know what. <laughs> And I want to be prepared for anything, obviously. So that's why you keep so much cash around. You want to be able to be prepared for a downturn? You want to be prepared for a, we, a crisis? We want to be prepared for anything, Becky. We want to be prepared for pandemics. We want to be pre prepared for uh, anything comes along. Now, that is the chief job I have. I have people's money that gave it to me 50 or 60 years ago, and some of them still have 100% of their money or essentially in it. And, and the one thing... And I've got the responsibility for five foundations that presently are going to get $80 billion, and I think we'll get a lot more over time, probably. Uh, we, don't, we don't want to permanently lose money. And, and uh, uh, you don't want to get that so that you go into a shell and don't do anything. But we have obligations to people on workers' compensation claims and auto accidents they've had that go out 50 years. And... You know, we have to run the place so that every check clears under any circumstances. And that's why, incidentally, we own treasury bills. We don't, we don't own commercial paper. We don't rely on bank lines or anything. Uh, when people get terrified, and they will occasionally, everything freezes. I mean, you know, and, and you're going to have to stand on your own feet at a time like that. It won't happen very often, but it'll happen occasionally. I know you've developed a thick skin over the years, but does it tick you off when people start questioning whether you've lost it, whether you can still... Well, I, I'm sure I've lost some of it. I can tell you all kinds of things I've lost. <laughs> no, that, that happens. But uh, uh, we haven't lost Geico or the railroads. We own or the, we, Berkshire, without me, is worth essentially the same as Berkshire with me. I mean, I, my, my value added is, is not high, but... I don't think I'm subtracting value, <laughs> but uh, the big thing is how our businesses do and what, what, what we get to add in the way of businesses over time. And we can add them through marketable securities. I mean, we own five and a half or a little over percent of Apple. It's probably the best business I know in the world. And we own five and a half percent of it. And that is a bigger commitment that we have in anything except insurance and the railroad. So it's... It's our third largest business. Yeah, it made the point that it was bigger than your biggest acquisition, Precision Oh, Casper. sure, no. It's our third largest business. All right, let me test you on your thick skin. Okay. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Here was the kicker of that Barron's cover story. He said, there's reasons to think that the company will be a market beater when he's gone. In the meantime, happy 90th. Yeah, well, that's, I, I hope it is a market beater when I'm gone. <laughs> I'm counting on it. I, I'm telling my estate 
and then the trustees that succeed my executors in the estate, I'm telling them to keep every share of Berkshire they have until they have this pattern of giving it away. I mean, I want them to look back and say, gee, we should have made this change earlier <laughs> because it's going to determine you know, how much we buy in the way of vaccines and, you know, and, and the, all kinds of things, education and all these things. And I feel terrific about Berkshire after I leave. <laughs> I want to talk about another issue that we have not touched on yet, and that's politics here in the United States. <laughs> Uh, we just watched the Nevada, Nevada caucus. Bernie Sanders walked away with the most delegates after that. He uh, looks to be uh, as the clear front runner for the nomination for the Democrats this time around. You have long been a supporter of the Democratic Party. What do you think? Well, I think I'm going to wait <laughs> and uh, uh, see who gets the nomination. But uh, I'm a Democrat, but I'm not a card carrying Democrat. And, 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 uh, I've, I've voted for Republicans. I've contributed to Republicans. Uh, in fact, I, I, I've only run for two offices in my life. One was head of the uh, Young Republicans at the University of Pennsylvania, and the other time I was actually on the ballot running for a delegate to the Republican National Convention in 1960. But normally I vote for Democrats, and uh, we will see what happens. Wow. That's the first time I've ever heard you say something like that. Well, it's... I've kept it a secret for all these years, but now it comes out. <laughs> you just said that you're not a card-carrying Democrat. That's true. You are a card-carrying capitalist. You Absolutely. actually have one of those in your wallet. Yeah. I've seen it. I don't know whether I'm a card-carrying capitalist, right? I don't think that's consistent with, inconsistent with what I've said on politics. Yeah, here it is. Duh. <laughs> I don't know whether that shows. For those who can't see, I'll show you on this camera right here. Carrying capitalist, and uh, this is what you carry in your wallet. Yeah, and I think I think we will have some of those available at the annual meeting too <laughs> for our shareholders. <laughs> I think Andrew's got a question that he wanted to jump in with here. Andrew, I was just going to uh, follow up on that question, Warren, which was about a year ago. We had asked you about Michael Bloomberg, and you had said that if he ever entered the race, he was somebody you would support. Would you support him? Is he your candidate? Well, I would. Uh, he, uh, I would certainly, I would certainly vote for him. Uh, uh, I don't think, I don't think another billionaire supporting him would be the, <laughs> the best thing to announce. <laughs> but uh, sure, I would, I, uh, I, I, I would have no trouble voting for Mike Bloomberg. And what do you think? And, and incidentally, are? It, it, well, I don't think I want to get into handicapping the race, but uh, 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 I, uh, I would say this in terms of Sanders. I actually agree with him in terms of certain things he would like to accomplish. I don't agree with him in many ways, but I, in, in terms of the fact that that uh, we ought to do better by the people that get left behind by our capitalist system, I don't think we should have killed the capitalist system in the process. I think we should make sure that the golden goose keeps laying more eggs, and it's worked wonderfully since 1776. But it doesn't work as well for people whose talents aren't aren't really geared to a market economy. And I don't think anybody should be left behind by an economy that has over $60,000 of GDP per capita. And so I'm, I'm a big fan of increasing the earned income tax credit. And uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I think there should be some changes made, but, but uh, uh, if given a choice, I would I'd certainly vote for Mike Bloomberg as opposed to Sanders. Uh, there is a, a plan. Let's talk about some of Sanders' plans. You said you agree with some of what his intentions are, but let's talk about some of those actual plans. One of those plans would be to give 20 percent of company stock to employees and put workers on the board. Uh, what do you think about that? That would be for any company, public company, that has more than $100 million in annual revenue or a $100 million balance sheet. Well, I don't want to get involved in evaluating his whole plan, but I think that would be a particularly bad idea. <laughs> because? Well, I just, I, I don't think that... Uh... I don't think putting 20 percent of the capitalists on a labor union support is a good idea either. And I, 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 uh, I think the market system works very, very well in terms of developing more goods and services. I mean, when you flew out here to Omaha, if you'd flown out here and you wouldn't have been able to fly in 1776, you wouldn't have seen anything. Everything you see is the product of a, a system that's worked like nothing's ever worked in the history of the world. So I, I do not believe in messing up our system of developing output. I do believe that that anybody's willing to work 40 hours a week and has a couple kids should not have to have an extra a second job. And I believe in having a 
higher income per people, not necessarily a higher minimum wage, but I, I, I do not think it's at all unreasonable that the income tax credit produces at least as $15 an hour, maybe higher in certain areas. That, uh, uh, so I, I'm in very much in sympathy with the fact that, that, that Senator Sanders believes that a lot of people are getting left behind and through no fault of their own. And there's all kinds of aspects of capitalism that can need in some ways to be uh, regulated, but I don't believe in giving up the capitalistic system. All right, let me slip in some questions that viewers have written in on this front. Michael Blank writes in, uh, please ask Warren if he thinks the market will sell off if it becomes clear that Bernie Sanders will win the Democratic nomination. I think I normally would never make a comment on something uh, like that, but I would say that if you had Sanders and a Democratic House and Senate, or if you had Trump with a Republican House and Senate, there would be a significant difference. But I don't think I would necessarily vote on what, in fact, I know I wouldn't vote on what I thought necessarily would affect the market the better. I, I think it's a very poor yardstick. I, I would not want to cast my vote in a presidential election based on which would be better for the market in the next 30 or 60 or 90 days after the election. But your reservations with Bernie Sanders, I assume, come with your concerns about what it means for the economy, not over 30, 60, 90 I, days, I, over a much broader period of Certain time. aspects of the economy. Just certain things, he, I, I, you know, I'd like to see done. I would like to see the earned income tax credit change dramatically upward. Uh, Alan Bucky writes in a letter. He says, if Michael Bloomberg becomes the Democratic candidate, would you consider buying his company? No. <laughs> I can give you a categorical answer to that. <laughs> because of the price? Because of the... There'd be, there'd be somebody to pay more. Warren, we've talked this morning about the coronavirus, but there are people who are waking up across the country now, kind of tuning in at this hour. So maybe we should address this again. With the markets indicated down 750 points, uh, with concerns about coronavirus spreading and now uh, worries about what that will mean for the global economy this year. I know this is not not something you look at a day-by-day -day basis, but how do you kind of wake up and, and, and read this and think through it? Uh, I don't think it, it... It makes no difference in our investments. I mean, it, uh, 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 there's always going to be some news, good or bad, every day. In fact, if you go back and read all the papers for the last 50 years, probably most of the headlines tend to be bad, but... But if you look at what happens to the economy, most of the things happen are extremely good. I mean, it's incredible what will happen over time. So if, the, if somebody came and told me that the global growth rate was going to be down 1 percent instead of a tenth of a percent, I'd still buy stocks if I, if I like the business and I like the price at which they, and I like the price better today than I liked them last Friday. Do you like prices better today? Will Berkshire sure. be buying stock today? Well, we'll certainly be more inclined to buy stock today than on Friday. Yeah, yeah. anything we were buying Friday, we will be buying today and, and feeling better about buying it. You know, one of the things you talked about in the annual letter was stock buybacks of Berkshire Hathaway. Right. And for the first time, you told people to call Mark Millard in your office outright if they have $20 million worth of Berkshire right. shares and they're ready to sell. Right. That's a really unusual move. Why did you do that? Well, we did it because... Uh, it's very hard to buy blocks uh, in the market of Berkshire. We practically never see blocks, except we do see them from estates or uh, occasionally. But if somebody's going to sell a hundred million shares, a hundred million dollars worth of Berkshire, and we want to buy it, um, we'd, we'd like them to call us, and we'll, if it's if it's if we're buying at that price level, we'll be buying. We'll buy it. Dan Mahoney actually wrote in with a very similar question. He just said, is it hard to buy back the shares? Like, yeah, it's, hard to buy, it's harder to buy back Berkshire shares than, say, Bank of America is buying back their shares. Bank of America bought back 8 or 9% of their stock last year, and they can really do it without moving the market. I mean, Apple's been buying back a ton of stock. They were buying stock at the same time we were buying stock. But it was easier for us to buy Apple stock, even though Apple itself was buying a lot of stock, than it is to buy Berkshire. Berkshire is... Uh, well, it's held by people that really plan to keep it. They're, they're, I think the amount of speculation in Berkshire stock is relatively low compared to most stocks. And so it's, 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 it's well, we bought $5 billion worth last year, but that's only 1% of the market cap. And, and I would say with a great many companies, you can buy 4 or 5% of the company fairly easily 
a year without disturbing the market. American Express has been buying it every year. Uh, so with you putting out an ad in the letter to shareholders, does that basically mean you are eager to buy more shares back? Depends on the price, but, but uh, we'll let anybody know if they... And we, Told them to call us before the opening or after the close, but but and only if only with blocks and only if they're ready to do business. Now there'll be a few people probably that probably try and call just to see whether we're buying or not. And we <laughs> we will we will not show a lot of patience with those people. <laughs> Let's talk about shares of Apple. Um, both from you just mentioning it with the share buybacks, with it being such a huge holding of yours. You've got more than 5.3% of the company right now? Right? Yeah, I think it's 5, 6, but 5 6 and, and, and it goes up every day. Well, let's There's talk about not because we're what buying. we've seen with the slowdown with the coronavirus, because Apple is one of the companies that has said it's going to have an impact, not only sure. with the stores that they've closed there, with the behavior of you know, Chinese customers, but also what happens with the supply chain. Supply chain, sure. What, how do you read through any of that? What are, what are you hearing? Do you know more than we do on that no, front? No, no. I don't know one thing more. I, I, I see... I may see Tim Cook at the annual meeting. I see him in Sun Valley once a year. No, I, I, I don't think. I don't think I've placed a phone call to Tim Cook in two or three years. Or I mean, it, it, no, I. It, all kinds of things are going to happen to Apple over the next ten years. The real question is, is, you know, what is the degree of pervasiveness and strength of that product five or ten years from now? And I don't think of Apple as a stock. I think it's our third largest business. It's also a high-flying technology company. It's one that's been at the forefront, but you've said in the past you didn't buy it because it's a technology company. Uh, I think it's a consumer product. In fact, I think I said this on the program a couple of years ago. I mean, it is obviously it's a consumer product company that uses technology, but we've got a lot of products that use technology at, at, at Berkshire. But uh, it's an incredible company, <laughs> and, and uh, I should have appreciated it earlier. There's a question that came in from... I guess the handle is GPG. Um, this is a question that came in on Twitter, and the writer asks, you've said that you can do fair value estimates of companies you follow at any time in your head. So please do one now for Apple. What went wrong with your estimate for IBM, and how is that, a mis how is that miscalculation different than for Apple? Uh, IBM's an entirely different business than Apple. I mean, uh, I, Apple doesn't resemble... IBM anymore to resemble it, it resembles C's candy in a way more. I mean, it is a incredibly useful product of people that grows more useful as the number of people uh, are involved. I mean, it's it's really interesting. You know, we call them smartphones. If you go back and look at the old telephone, that was an incredible useful product. It changed my mother's life and my dad's. Life. It changed lives in every way, and they. They uh, took a long time to become pervasive, and it was very expensive initially, but it, it, it changed the world. And the smartphone uh, is part of hundreds and hundreds of millions of people's lives in all aspects of their lives. They, it's used for as all kinds of utility. It's a consumer product. Are you a consumer of its products at this point? You've had a flip phone uh, for forever. Ah, <laughs> I'm glad you brought that up. <laughs> I, I, I am now using, not very often, but I'm, I'm using the latest model. And, and uh, uh, I'll give you a little preview of our, our uh, movie for the annual meeting. We haven't done it yet, but it will probably show me crushing with my foot, my, my old flip phone, while, while cozying up to the, <laughs> the new smartphone. <laughs> when did you get the smartphone? Uh, I've been given several of them, but... Uh, 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 in, in, including by Tim Cook. <laughs> One finally stuck. What, pardon me? One finally stuck. You're actually. Uh, yeah, absolutely. No, I, I, my flip phone is permanently gone. The number's been changed to my <laughs> new phone. Wow. Yeah, that's impressive. I, I mean, you're looking at a, an 89-year-old guy that's barely beginning to be with it. <laughs> what do you like best about the phone? And what do you like least? Well, I don't, I don't use all its facilities like most people. I mean, most people are living their lives around it, and uh, 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 I use it as a phone. <laughs> as a phone and nothing yeah, I else. use it as a phone. I don't like it when investment bankers talk about EBITDA, which I would translate as <laughs> earnings. <laughs>
That was Berkshire Hathaway Vice Chairman Charlie Munger about a week and a half ago when he was speaking at uh, the annual shareholders meeting for his other company, The Daily Journal, answering questions, giving his uh, usual straight answers when things come up as questions. Uh, Warren, that was Charlie talking about EBITDA earnings, yeah. calling them BS earnings, although he said it a little uh, <laughs> more. <laughs> more explicitly. You, in your shareholder letter for Berkshire Hathaway, also wrote about how you don't believe in gap earnings. So what, how do you guys come about this? What do you think? Uh, you still have to report these numbers, but you're basically telling shareholders don't listen to them. Well, the, 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 yeah, it's two different principles. I mean, the, the gap numbers, which show us earning $80 billion, which is more than any company's ever earned in history. Uh, uh, and we explain why that, that really isn't the relevant statistic, because a lot of that was just the stock market going up, which now gets counted in our earnings. And Charlie was express, expressing an opinion we both have. I mean, Char, Charlie's the shy, reticent one, <laughs> one of the pair, but uh, uh, Charlie is the best partner anybody could possibly have. We've been partners now for 60 years, and, and uh, you could not have a better partner. Uh, he, at 96, uh, a, a woman, since that meeting, actually, uh, in the last couple of weeks, a woman said to him, is it true, Mr. Munger, that you have eight children? And Charlie's reply was, so far. <laughs> so, uh, Charlie, Charlie is very much... <laughs> <laughs> an active partner, we'll put it that way. <laughs> Next time I see him, I'll get an update on that to see what that's uh, so far still yeah. going. Okay, let us know what happens. With <laughs> yeah, <it>. I will. <laughs> you know, we watch pretty closely Charlie's shareholder meeting for the Daily Journal. Sure. We send cameras out, we watch it. I've been out myself. Do you watch that meeting too to see what he has? I, I watched it all on YouTube after, afterwards, but my sister and my, one of my good friends and my niece were all there. And, and no, I, I end up watching it, and I actually end up reading it, usually, too. And, uh, I wouldn't miss it. But I don't go out for it. Was there anything he said that surprised you this time around? And I'm just looking through some of his... Actually, nothing Charlie says can surprise me. <laughs> <laughs> Was there anything that enlightened you or changed your opinion on something? Maybe something... No, that thought... but I learn from Charlie every time I talk to him. Charlie has the best 30-second mind in the world, so I can go to him with an, a new question, a new problem of any kind, and it goes through about eight filters in his mind in, in 10 seconds, and he gets to the essence of any problem. Uh, it, 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 there is nobody better to talk to than Charlie at age 96. Is there anything you've talked to him about recently that you might be able to share? I don't know if you want to share the conversations you guys have privately, but anything where you've bounced something off of him? And he... Well, I bounce... I, 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 we, we talk about a lot of things, and we talk a lot of, uh, we talk particularly about things we don't know the answer to. And, and, you know, we find the whole scene so interesting, whether it's politically or economically or the world. I mean, it, 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 it's incredibly interesting to us, and, and we're particularly interested in each other's view, although I think I'm more interested in his view than he is in mine. <laughs> and that, that would be a correct decision to make for somebody overhearing us. <laughs> What's uh, something you guys don't understand right now? Oh, we, we do not understand at all what the outcome will be uh, in a world where 13 trillion is being borrowed at less than zero. And even uh, Greece went on short term. I think Greece, the 10 year bond is 1%, for example. And, uh, and at the same time, in this country, we're having, under very good business and market conditions, we're having a 4.5% federal deficit and nobody is concerned in the least. Uh, and we're talking about massive new programs and so on. Everybody talks about how they'll pay for them, but they really, you know, the deficit's going to widen. So we don't know what world comes out of something where you start with extremely low interest rates and high rates of growth, and then what you do for stimulus uh, later on. But the whole game, I mean, the game always unfolds differently than you expect, and, and that's what makes it so interesting. You know, the 10-year, speaking of these low rates, uh, just a little bit ago hit its lowest yield since July of 2016 this morning. I think it was 1.377 percent. We're back at 1.396 percent. But 10-year rates below 1.4 percent. Yeah. Did you have anticipated this? Well, it, it makes no sense to lend money at 1.4% to the U.S. government when it's government policy to change 
to have 2% a year inflation. I mean, you've got, you've got, the government is telling you we're going to give you 1.4% and tax you on it. And on the other hand, we're going to presumably devalue that money at 2% a year. Uh, so these are very unusual conditions. And uh, classical economics, it doesn't appear uh, that, you know, what do people do under such circumstances? Does everybody buy a mattress and stick their money under the mattress or what? And it particularly seems uh, unusual when the world is generally prosperous. And, you know, but that's, the game is always changing, but it always looks logical in retrospect, and it and it's always looks puzzling <laughs> prospectively. But there's always things to do that make sense, too. Like what? Well, I hope it's what we're doing. <laughs> it's buying good businesses at decent prices, whether all of the businesses or parts of the businesses through the stock market. You know, you told me a year and a half ago, maybe longer, that when you went out to try and buy whole businesses right now, it just looks too expensive, which is why you started buying pieces of companies, more stocks, putting money in like, places yeah. like Apple. Is that still the case? Is it still a huge premium to try and buy a company outright? There's quite a premium, and part of the premium is because... You can borrow so much money so cheap, uh, so cheaply in buying those businesses. Obviously, you can pay more for a, a business if you can uh, borrow a very high percentage of the purchase price and of the future cash flow committed to it. And you can borrow at low rates with, with very little in the way of restrictions, uh, restrictive covenants or anything of the sort. I mean, that, that's going to bring higher prices. And the demand for that is huge. And people look at those rates on the 30-year or the 10-year, and they say to themselves, gee, I can't live on that. And so they, they stretch and buy poor credits. But that's, that's just part of the human cycle over time. And that, that leads to something else, and that leads to something else. In the end, if you own good businesses at the right price, you're going to do fine. You're often quoted as saying that you don't know who's skinny dipping until the tide goes out, who's swimming naked until yeah, the tide goes out, exactly. whatever it may be. You get the sense with a high tide right now, that there's a lot of skinny dipping Well, it, we're certainly doing, we're allowing people to borrow money on much weaker terms than we were five or ten years ago. You couldn't borrow money at all there for a period of ten years ago. I mean, you literally, you could, Berkshire couldn't borrow money. I mean, the, 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 everything stopped. And uh, now we've, the pendulum has swung dramatically and Yet we still have, you know, we have very, very, very low rates. It, it, it's hard to believe that 10 years or 20 years from now we will have a substantial continuation of negative interest rates. Because but I've already seen things I didn't think could happen. So man, who knows what could happen? That's what makes it interesting. Let's get back out uh, to Omaha uh, where Becky Quick uh, is with Warren Buffett. And um, there's a lot of important things happening, but don't forget that March Madness is right around the corner, uh, Becky. Uh, and I, oh, I, I, I you should see what he's doing right <laughs> yeah. now, Joe. He was oh. rubbing his hands as you said that. <laughs> now it, you're talking his language. Now, well, uh, Creighton, it was 70 to 35 at one point, and I had Creighton yesterday. I don't know if you were paying attention to that. Uh, did, were you watching that at all, Warren? Nebraska plays tonight. I'm, we pay attention. <laughs> we pay attention to Creighton out here. <laughs> they're good. We talked about it earlier this morning off they're camera. They're peaking. I think they're peaking. I mean, they're getting better and better and better. The, the three-point shooting was, I think that, that one guy was seven for seven at one point yesterday, which is, I, I'd be like seven for 10,000 for three-pointers, I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, get back to business. I just, I, I, I'm looking forward to it, Warren. And, and I know we always have our own personal bet. Uh, if I get them all right, you give me Berkshire Hathaway, which uh, would would be cool for me. <laughs> I'll you, tell you, if you get if you, if you get it all the way, I'll give you my Berkshire Hathaway shares all the way to the sixty-four. <laughs> wow! Wow! Fill out a bracket the if it's perfect. Pledge. It gets, that's the ultimate that's, giving that's pledge. Giving <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's how sure he is that you won't be able to do it. I'm pretty sure. Um, Andrew, I hear you. I, I hear you have a question too, Andrew. I ha I actually have a couple, and I. Uh, Thought that I read the letter like everybody else over the weekend. It was fascinated by so many of your comments, Warren. Specifically, I wanted to ask you, you talk about diversity on boards in this letter. Um, and, and one of the things I wanted you to weigh in on, if you could, is I don't know if you saw, but David Solomon, the CEO of Goldman Sachs, on our air actually, announced a couple weeks ago that he won't be taking any companies public, Goldman won't, uh, unless they have at least one uh, diverse board member and are likely going to push that to two. Uh, 
you know, in, in the state of California, they put a law into place saying that you needed to have a female board member. Um, and I'm curious what you think of uh, not just the, the push towards more diversity on boards, but the requirement. Because I also note in your letter that you have very specific thoughts about what it means to be a board member, what it means to be an independent board member, how wealth uh, is involved in all of that. What are your thoughts? Well, uh, at, at Berkshire for decades, we've given the uh, three factors in addition to integrity, but uh, uh, for board membership. And, and, and uh, we want people who are business savvy. Uh, we want them uh, to have a, uh, a strong uh, personal interest in, 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 in Berkshire itself. And uh, we've, we, uh, <clears throat> we've got directors who really uh, represent shareholders, basically, at Berkshire, and I think they do a great job. Now, that doesn't mean that they don't think that we should delight our customers, that we should treat associates well, that, that we should be, behave well in our community, both local and national. But, but our, share, our, our directors represent the shareholders. So, Warren, just to, just to follow up on it, though, what, what's your thought about both the requirement that, that maybe banks and others, uh, investors, are going to force companies to have uh, diverse candidates on their board, uh, laws, as I mentioned, in California? Yeah, I uh, actually, there, there may be, there's been sent to us a proposal which, unless it's withdrawn, will be on our proxy. I can't tell you precisely what it says. But that relates to this issue, and we will get our shareholders' view on it. Uh, uh, I, I personally, uh, and I, I, I want shareholders that I, I want directors that represent the shareholders. And you know, at, in terms of my estate, uh, you know, with with maybe currently eighty billion dollars worth of shares to give to philanthropy, I, I hope that we have, a, and I, we do have a group right. of directors that I think will be very conscious of doing the right thing. The reason I ask the question is because the other point you made, which I think is a very smart one and is often misconstrued in the corporate governance land, is that an independent director these days isn't always independent in large part. And, and you make the point that uh, those that don't come to the table with some form of wealth often need the job. Uh, they need the money. They want the money. And therefore, that makes them less independent. And the reason I ask this is um, one of the things as we've been trying to get more diverse candidates uh, on boards, more women on boards. Um, as you know, there are, there, are, there are fewer CEOs, fewer people who have made enormous amounts of money, and people, therefore, then can question their independence. It becomes a very tricky issue, and, and that's what I was hoping you might weigh in on. Yeah, Andrew, I, I've been on 21 publicly owned, uh, boards of publicly owned companies, and I've seen them in operation, and I would say that, that people that uh, I have often seen, and that's perfectly understandable, I have often seen people who are uh, classified as independent directors, and they are getting $300,000 a year for a job that takes them uh, a couple of days, uh, maybe six times a year, maybe four times a year, and uh, uh, the company flies them to their office, and it's, it's very enjoyable, and the company's good, and... and uh, uh, who wouldn't want a job like that? I mean, uh, it's it's an incredible job, and people. I get calls from, I get calls from headhunters. I get calls from CEOs, and uh, uh, they ask, you know, who I think would make a quote good end quote director. And what they are asking is, you know, who is not going to cause too much trouble, and who is going to reflect who their name is going to reflect credit on the institution, and they are not looking for somebody that that. Uh, uh, that I would regard as really independent. I, and I don't blame them. I mean, you know, if, 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 if I had spent my life being, a, you know, a teacher or whatever it might be, I mean, uh, my IQ is just as high as the average or higher than the people on the boards and all that. But on the other hand, I want to get on a board. I mean, 300,000 bucks a year <laughs> would look terrific. And you don't even have to retire, probably, in most cases, at 65 or anything of the sort. So to call them independent is ridiculous. Uh, and uh, if you're if you're on one board like that, you want to really go on another one and be, make six hundred thousand a year, and you are not going to do things that irritate your present CEO. So when 
he or she gets a call and says, would this guy make a good director, that the answer is no. I mean, it, it's, it, it's, it's just ridiculous to ignore the, the factor of compensation with board members. Okay. All right, let me, let me ask a follow-up question that is similarly related, yeah. Warren, and that's just having to do with sustainability, all these issues that are out there. Guys in the control room, sorry, this is not where I told you I was going, but Abhishek Boadra wrote in a, a question. He said, Larry Fink recently said that our investment conviction is that sustainability and climate-integrated portfolios can provide better risk-adjusted returns to investors. What's your view on sustainable investing? Well, I, I, I don't happen to make that decision when I'm buying the stocks in our portfolio. I'm, I'm, I, what their individual policies are, I, I think they're all pro-social. I mean, obviously, you've got to be in tune with your society. But if you, if you think that I look down at a bunch of stocks and decide whether to buy Apple or whether to buy uh, J.P. Morgan or... Uh, I am not... I'm not using the the uh, factors and, and uh, the delays out. Okay. I, I want to run through a series of questions that have been in. These are kind of all over the map, so forgive me. We'll bounce around, but these are questions that came in from viewers that I thought were good ones. Uh, Lucas writes in. He said, did Justin Sun change your mind on cryptocurrencies? <laughs> For anybody who doesn't know, Justin Sun bought the dinner or the lunch that you just had from the last Glide Foundation fundraiser. He is actively involved in Bitcoin. Um, after that meeting, his PR people put out some notes saying that, you know, you kind of listen to cryptocurrency and maybe you're a little more in tune with the idea of Bitcoin now. Well, I would say this. When Justin and four friends came, they behaved perfectly and we had a good three and a half hour dinner and the whole thing was a very friendly exchange of ideas. But uh, cryptocurrencies basically have no value and they don't produce anything. So you can look at your little ledger item for the next 20 years and it says you've got X of this cryptocurrency or that, it doesn't reproduce, it doesn't, it doesn't deliver, it, it can't mail you a check, it can't do anything. And what you hope is that somebody else comes along and pays you more money for it later on. But then that person's got the problem. But in terms of value, uh, you know, zero. <laughs> so it sounds like he did not change your position. No, but I didn't change his either. And I, I, I had a very pleasant dinner and those people were, they behaved more than well. And they gave 4.6, or Justin gave 4.6 million to Glide, and that will buy a lot of meals and provide a lot of beds for people in San Francisco. So I, I thank him. Uh, he gave you some Bitcoin. What's it feel like to be a Bitcoin? <laughs> I, uh, I don't have any Bitcoin. <laughs> you, you don't? No. Okay. No. You don't own Bitcoin. I, I will, no, I do not own one. I don't own any cryptocurrency. I never will. And... Uh, you know, in, in the end, I, I may start a war in currency. You know, maybe I can create one and I'll say there's only going to be 21 million of them and you can have a little ledger sheet from me and everything that says you have it. And, and you can have it after I die. And you, but you can't do anything with it except sell it to somebody else. And the interesting thing, of course, is that Bitcoin's been out there a long time and people talked about how it would be used in, in various kinds of exchange. But none of our companies are doing business in in Bitcoin or anything. Yeah, uh, uh, Bitcoin has been used, I think, to move around a fair amount of money illegally. So the, the, the people- maybe that, in countries the, where you have- Yeah, so the, 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 the logical move from the introduction of Bitcoin is to go short suitcases because the money that was taken in suitcases from one country to another, suitcases will probably fall off in demand. I mean, uh, so you can look at that as the economic contribution of, of Bitcoin to the society is a... All right, let's talk about a question that comes in from Rusty Thomas, and he has, he's got a question on baseball. He said, given Warren's love of baseball and the contrast between his deft management of the Solomon Brothers scandal and Major League Baseball's inexplicable mismanagement of the Astros' sign-stealing debacle, what advice would Warren provide MLB Commissioner Manfred to restore confidence and integrity in the game? Yeah, well... It survived the Black Sox scandal back around 1920, and uh, uh, people will continue to love baseball. But uh, uh, you know, it was one thing to steal signs if you were on second base, but it, 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 it's bad. Baseball will get past this. 
You're people a huge baseball fan. Were you, Pardon me? You're a huge baseball fan. Were you surprised to hear about Yeah, I was surprised this? to hear about it, yeah. But, uh, but then I find out that Bobby Thompson's home run, you know. <laughs> somebody just stole the sign, I think, off Ralph Bragg or somebody, you know. It, uh, so uh, people are going to, in any games, including the stock market game, you know, a certain number of people cheat. And, uh, and generally we have people that administer things to try and minimize the, the cheating. And, and I'm sure that Major League Baseball will, will address the problem. Should the we, Astros we, players get off scot-free? Oh, I, I'm not going to make a judgment on that. But uh, Joe Jackson certainly didn't. Yeah. 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 Uh, let me ask you about a question that came in from several viewers, actually, and that's about the ETFs. Uh, DeMosley Management wrote this version of the question, and news agencies have reported that Berkshire Hathaway uh, purchased two ETFs. So can you talk about if this purchase happened, and if the purchase happened, who purchased the ETF for Berkshire Hathaway, and how was the decision made to purchase it? Yeah, it the wasn't me. Yeah. It wasn't me, or it wasn't Todd, or it wasn't Ted. And uh, it, it happened in some pension fund, and we have a few pension funds that aren't actually managed by us. But I, uh, all I can tell you is that nobody, at, nobody that manages money at Berkshire is buying ETFs, nor do I see any possibility that they will. Okay. Uh, another purchase that came up recently, Kroger. Um, and Jason Escamilla writes in, was that one of yours or, or a lieutenant's pick? It, w it was one of the others. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I know Kroger. Kroger. Kroger's done a good job, but it's in a very tough business. I mean, when you have, when you have uh, uh, Amazon and Walmart slugging it out and Costco taking a special part of it and everything, it's a tough business, but they've done a good job. And, and one of our managers decided to buy that. Okay. Um, and, and then Kraft Heinz. This comes in from David Hall. He says, Mr. Buffett, while Kraft Heinz continues to whittle down their total debt, do you feel that the current dividend payout is appropriate, or should it be reduced further to free up more cash flow to reduce debt more rapidly? Now, I, I think Kraft Heinz should pay down its debt, and it should, but I think under present circumstances, it appears that it can pay the dividend and, and pay down debt at a reasonable rate, and it has too much debt, but it doesn't have some... It doesn't have debt it can't pay down, and uh, uh, the, sh the debt holders are going to get the interest, and the, the debt should come down year by year. And I, I think it will, and I think it can with the present dividend, but who knows for sure in the future. Theo Philos writes in a similar question and says, do you still believe in the company and management at Kraft Heinz? It, it's, it's still a great business in the sense that it earns, we'll say, $5 billion after depreciation uh, uh, pre-tax uh, on Seven billion of tangible assets. It uses about seven billion of fixed assets. It doesn't know that working capital. Well, I mean, the, it, it, it's a very valuable business. But we paid too much for 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 craft, and we we took on more debt in that. And but we paid too much. Uh, another question comes in from Beal again on Kraft Heinz, and uh, this person writes in: Private labels have performed very well against brands like Kraft Heinz, but they haven't made a dent against other brands like Coca Cola or C's. Why do you think that is, and how do you think about brands moats, given your experience with Kraft? Uh, brands are always going to be in a fight with the retailer, and uh, it varies by country enormously. It varies by product category. Uh, if people... I worked in a grocery store in 1941. Charlie worked in the same one in 1940. People would call and they'd ask for a can of peas, and I'd write down a can of peas. They'd call in and they'd, they'd ask for Heinz ketchup, and I, I better get, give them Heinz ketchup. They didn't care which brand the peas were. They didn't care that much whether the two quarts of milk we sent them were this brand or that brand, but they cared whether it, it, was, it, was, uh, it was Heinz ketchup. Uh, uh, that was, it, you know, 1941. Uh, some brands are terribly strong. Uh, you can't bring out a... A private label cola and do very well with it. And people have tried for a long, long time. On the other hand, you can bring out private labels and lots of products and and they sell very well. And uh, you know, you take Costco with their own Kirkland label. I mean that that label grows dramatically, it cuts across categories. It 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 uh, you know, it, it, it's done since 1992 or whenever it was introduced. Other people spent 100 years, you know, with huge amounts of advertising and special display, all kinds of things. So 
the battle goes on, I would say that the retailer has gained ground against brands to some degree, but brands are still terribly important. I mean, uh, uh, try and give me a $10 billion budget and ask me to bring out another Coca-Cola that makes a dent in Coca-Cola, and I can't do it. Warren, one of the questions that did come in, it was something that you wrote about in the annual letter, was uh, the role that Greg and Ajit play. Uh, Greg Abel, Ajit Jain, the two vice chairmen who were recently added as vice chairman, the role that they're going to be playing in the annual meeting with shareholders. You said that they will play a larger role in the shareholder meeting. How, how will that work? Well, it will mean that any shareholder or any of the journalists there who are presenting questions from shareholders that have been sent to them can direct those questions to either Ajit uh, or to Greg. Uh, so if they were insurance questions, they might want to direct them to Ajit, not insurance questions to Greg. But they will be there, and uh, uh, we'll have 60 or so questions. We don't know what they're going to be. And, and if, if anybody says, I would like Greg to answer this or I would like Ajit to answer this, then they're, they're right there adjacent to us. They'll be sitting on stage with you and Charlie? Well, there's a... Yeah, there's... There, well, they'll be sitting in front of the crowd. There's two different levels of, of tiers there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, again, you said you did this because you'd gotten a lot of questions from directors, shareholders, other people who had kind of advised you that they thought it was good for them to be yeah. playing a bigger role. What yeah, they, everybody... I, I heard from quite a few more people. Now, we directed questions out to them where they were sitting with the directors out in front, and then the spotlight went down. But... This may encourage more questions directly of them, and that'll be terrific. Okay. Uh, Jim Bean writes in a question. He says, in the past, both you and Bill Gates have stated that half of the board meetings are spent discussing succession. How has this changed since Ajit and Greg are on the board? Do they leave the room? They leave the room. Uh, but uh, if I die tonight, the board tomorrow morning knows exactly what they're going to do. But, uh, uh, Hope they're polite about it, let the body cool off. <laughs> but basically, they know what they're going to do. Uh, and the, the interesting thing about it is we own, a, you know, the Apple and J.P. Morgan, all those things. I don't know who's going to succeed uh, the CEOs of, of any of the companies I think that we own stock in. <laughs> but uh, uh, we're well prepared for succession. It's almost going to be embarrassing how well... <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's get to a few more shareholder questions. Uh, Chip Crook writes in a note and says it was reported that Boeing was looking for a large cash loan. Were you ever approached about Berkshire loaning the money, kind of like the Goldman Sachs deal from years, Sachs deal from years no, ago? I think, I think Boeing's raised about $13 billion, uh, but that's bank-type money. In other words, I, my memory is that it's, it's maybe 1%, you know, plus they they're, they're looking for they're, they're looking for traditional bank loans, and we don't make tra traditional bank loans. You also talked in the letter about how Berkshire Hathaway has, Berkshire Hathaway, Hathaway Energy, I should say, has the ability and the talent to manage big investments, $100 billion and more. I think you wrote, we stand ready and willing and able on such opportunities. Uh, California Governor Gavin Newsom uh, asked you at one point to bid on PG&E. Is that such an opportunity? PG&E, we obviously, I mean, we work with them for decades and been familiar with them, uh, but, but that doesn't, that doesn't fit Berkshire, but if, if there were a hundred billion of transmission lines or whatever it might be, Berkshire could do it. I mean, and we would love it. Uh, that happens to be a very tough thing to do because you're across all these states and everybody says, not in my backyard and all that, but, but uh, there can be huge intelligent investment made in the utility energy an, uh, area and no one is better equipped to do it than Berkshire in both talent and resources. Why does PG&E not fit that bill? It's too tough. I don't, I don't know the answer to it. I mean, it, uh, uh, rearranging that utility. Uh, I think, uh, I know Governor Newsom, I think he's a very, very, very smart guy. And, and in terms of solving this problem, it's just not easy. You've got so many constituencies and they're at each other's throats and there's lots of money involved. And uh, I don't want to be the guy to try. I, I don't know how to solve all that. Okay. Um... Let's go on to a question that is posed by Ken Ducey. He says, you sold 31 newspapers after buying them over 40 years as a self-described newspaper addict. You said recently that most newspapers were toast. I know that's not exactly that's what you not, said. Yeah, that's not true. But actually. this is in his question. You can answer that, yeah. too. Do you believe the problem with local newspapers is a lack of demand or a lack of innovation and a new business model? Well, the problem is that, well, getting back to the toast comment, Andy Sherware actually is the fellow that said toast. He was interviewing me, and I repeated it. But... Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the problem is, and even every day, 
the circulation of the papers and every, every print, print circulation goes down. And the interesting thing about it, of course, is that the three survivors so far that look promising online are the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and the Washington Post. All three of those papers sold their smaller papers. Uh, the New York Times sold, I think, 11 papers about seven or eight years ago. The uh, Dow Jones, which owned uh, the Wall Street Journal and now is owned by News Corp, they sold the Ottawa newspapers, eight papers. Washington Post sold the Everett Herald. So they all saw the handwriting on the wall before I did, and they all sold their papers. That was their reaction. They did not, they did not try and figure out the online solutions. They, they got out of them, and unfortunately, uh, I, I bought some, and we're, we're still in them. I mean, we are financing Lee, and we think Lee has by far the best opportunity to continue print as long as anybody and to find an online solution for these papers. So we put new money into the newspaper industry here, or we've committed to do it. It will close in a month or two. And then finally, very quickly, we are in the Berkshire Hathaway's headquarters building here in Omaha. Uh, Strom writes in a question that says, why did you decide to rent your offices for all these years instead of buying the building or building your own office building? Well, we only use one floor of the 15 floors here, but we have a, signed a lease for the next 20 years on one more floor. So it shows just how flexible our thinking is about the future. <laughs> how much Berkshire. growth you're anticipating? Yeah, we don't want a big headquarters office. If we had a big headquarters office, we'd fill it, believe me. I mean, if we had 15 floors of our own, we'd have 15 floors worth of people. <laughs> uh, Warren, uh, uh, before we let you go, let's just go back to the futures again this morning, because right now the Dow is indicated to open down about 100 and, or 830 points. Um, weakness again on concerns about coronavirus and what that means. What's your mentality today as you kind of go out and look at the stock market and decide what you're going to do? We're buying businesses to own for 20 or 30 years. We buy them in whole. We buy them in part. They're called stocks when we buy them in part. And we think the 20 and 30 year outlook is not changed by coronavirus. Warren, I want to thank you for your time today. We really appreciate it. Uh, your generosity with your time. And uh, we hope to see you again soon. Come every year. Thank you. <laughs>